Well, that was a lot. Uh, wow. Oh, and they're still coming in. Okay. Uh, <laughs> my friend. Um, but that's usual for me. I have disadvantage on most composure roles. Uh, <laughs> or social interaction. Anyway, uh, oh, they're still coming in. I guess we'll, we'll be patiently wait and quietly and stare as everyone enters. Has everybody turned to us? Find your seat. Good job. Just, we still coming? We still got more line? Yeah, we do. Okay. not going to be able to stay and do any autographs. You guys can see him tomorrow, I believe. Do you know yes, I have tomorrow at a time. <laughs> that one. 2.30. His autograph session will be tomorrow at 2.30. So um, we've got to get you guys as quickly out as possible. And you guys enjoy. <laughs> so welcome, everyone to a panel entitled uh, Critical Role RPGs and Tabletop Renaissance. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Matthew Mercer. I'm a voice actor from Los Angeles and... And uh, I appreciate that I can tell the Keyleth cosplays from the antlers in the audience. <laughs> yes! <laughs> uh, but yeah, I also uh, am Dungeon Master for a show called Critical Role. Who here? Raise your hand if you don't know what Critical Role is. Oh, you're going to be really confused, but let's try and do this. So, Critical Role is a Twitch stream, began two years ago, uh, where I run a bunch of other friends of mine who are also voice actors through a game of Dungeons and Dragons weekly. Um, you, mostly weekly, as often as we can. Sometimes we gotta take breaks, or we'll die. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that's generally it, we're just playing Dungeons and Dragons. And uh, it's, it, it was something we thought might be cool when we were asked to do it, and a lot of people happen to also want to watch, and that's cool too. <laughs> and not just watch, but like go off and then play their own adventures, and that's, that's kind of the cool thing. And I will say, like, and I've, I've had a lot of conversations about this, and like interviews or uh, philosophical discussions with like uh, Matt Koval or Perkins and different people about like what it is about D&D &D and tabletop streaming that makes it so interesting and for me there's not a lot of media out there that empowers the viewer when they're inspired to go ahead and do the same thing immediately you know you can grow up watching films and cartoons and be like I want to do that and you can you just have to go to school for many many years and then build up a resume and like try and make work for it or spend countless hours trying to work on an independent project yourself and that's really cool but it takes a big investment to get there uh, tabletop role playing, if you watch it and you're inspired to do it, you can buy a book tomorrow, get some friends together, and have the same exact experience in your own living room. And it, nothing excites me more than going and seeing people who either hadn't played in 10, 15 years, who then m message us on Twitter with pictures of their game group that they just got together for the first time and who knows how long, or families that are playing D&D together on the weekends now. It's become their family game night and a wonderful bonding experience for them. Or a bunch of uh, younger teens who missed the whole RPG generation and never had really an opportunity to see how to play an RPG and how thrilling and wonderful it can be, learn through all these different streams online that, oh, I can totally do that, and then go and do so. So I, I'm really excited and proud and overwhelmed of the response to ours, let alone the entire community of wonderful RPG streamers out there. Um, so I'm, I'm excited and I'm standing now in front of a room of people who are here for that reason, and that blows my mind on a perpetual basis. Um, 
So, uh, as a heads up to, we're going to do our best to not spoil anything tonight. So when we get to a Q&A portion tonight, let's try and be respectful of people that aren't caught up. Um, especially those, especially some revelations in the most recent 100th episode. Try our best. Which, by the way, 100 episodes, what the what? It's crazy. Man. Like, if you guys aren't sick of me by now, I guess, at this point, we're cool then. Because you guys, that's a lot of time looking at my face. <laughs> Like even, even Marisha's like, I gotta take a break. So you guys, well done. No, oh, you too. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, it's 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 been a wild ride. This I, I owe I owe so much to role playing games, both you know, like JRPG, video game RPGs, and tabletop role playing games. That they, this type of storytelling that let me know who I want to be. You know, through sending books, reading, growing up. Reading fantasy novels and uh, fiction novels based on sci-fi universes, Arthur C. Clarke, Isaac Asimov, uh, the Piers Anthony, Tolkien, like all, I was raised by stories and, and other storytellers. And, uh, you know, it's, it's those heroic stories, uh, trials and tribulations, and battling against adversity, and knowing what's right for you and standing up for that in the face of uh, people telling you otherwise. It's those type of stories that teach us that it's important to rise up to protect yourself, to protect your friends, and the ideals, philosophies, and notions that you hold dear to yourself, while also being open to conversation about different, uh, different ideas. You know, there, there's this very heavily entrenched idea uh, in modern culture, especially uh, modern political culture, just general culture, that if you have different ideas, the other person, you, you can't talk about it. We disagree, therefore, there is no conversation. And I think that, that doesn't get us anywhere. And I think a lot of these stories, a lot of these tales that many of us create ourselves or grew up watching, whether it be films, television, cartoon, teach us different perspectives. And that each person, while they may disagree on certain things, what is honest and truth to you, if it even is different from the truth to them, doesn't mean that it's necessarily right or wrong. It's that conversation you have to have to come to an understanding and realize you really don't have that much different. Um, whether it be religion-based, whether it be cultural-based, whether it be interests, uh, where you grew up, where you live now, where your family's from, any of that, you know, whether it be skin tone, sexuality, all that is all just human beings trying to find happiness. And the basis of everything that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, we're just trying to be happy and make others happy. And to me, storytelling is one of the most positive and uh, inspirational ways that you can bring people together regardless of your past and walks of life and become closer friends and enjoy each other's company and become more empathic to each other and you know learn more about other perspectives in life. It's a wonderful, healthy experience. And if you haven't had the opportunity to sit down at a table and roll some dice and just create an improvised story with friends or find new friends through that process, I highly recommend it. There are a number of wonderful uh, People that volunteer at every convention to run game rooms and to dungeon master or game master games at various events. And if you haven't had the chance and you have a free evening, look it up. Give it a shot. You'll be surprised how wonderful and welcoming these people are. Like, you think anime conventions are welcoming? A kind of you know, the let your freak flag fly? <laughs> the tabletop community's been doing this for 30, 40 years. <laughs> so. You know, t take that, that jump. And, and it may take you a while to find the right group because, you know, different people do have different perspectives and that's not a bad thing. Some game group you might go to might be very, very hardcore, uh, heavy, intense role playing and you're like, I want more of a casual gaming, roll dice and kill things, take loot experience. And that's cool. Just make sure that you express that in, uh, at the very beginning so you can decide whether or not this is the type of game for you and you don't have causing any negative emotions. And conversely, if you still want to play together, even though you have these different ideas, talk to your dungeon master or game master about trying to facilitate a story that gives you a little bit of both. You may end up finding yourself pulled out of your comfort zone and end up enjoying that part of the role-playing game you didn't think you did. If you're like, no, I just want to min-max my characters and you know, defeat demons and see how much experience points I can get. If you allow yourself to maybe step into that discomfort of role-playing and maybe coming up with a character voice or at the very least, talking in character and 
It may feel a little weird at first, but you might be surprised at how much you enjoy it. And conversely, if you're a heavy theatrical, if you're like, you know, heavy in a community theater, like, I love D&D because of the drama. <laughs> and you show up to a table and they're like, that's cool, man. Roll your attack. <laughs> Don't be afraid to embrace the rule set either. And one thing I want to express here is every dungeon master, game master, has their own specific, unique style. And you can't expect one table to be like the other. Uh, I want to try and get this across as much as I can. I'm so happy that Critical Role uh, has found such a great community and people seem to resonate with our storytelling. Um, but I'm also a very different dungeon master than everyone out there. And I don't want anybody to go to a table and expect what I provide uh, at anybody else's game. They'll provide some things that may not be quite what I do, or not quite as good as I do, and they'll provide some things that are far better than I provide. Every person has their strengths and weaknesses. I'm very heavy narrative, I'm very heavy into the, uh, the intense role-playing circumstances and the, the, you know, the actor-driven character breakdowns and, and, and existential crises that is human existence. While also killing shit every now and then. <laughs> other tables, but, but, I, but I try and play the rules as well as I can, but also I mess up the rules every now and then, as I'm sure you've seen Twitch chat mention. <laughs> But that's part of the fun too. There are people out there that are much better at keeping a cohesive rule set or running a very open-ended, like sandbox, political-based, driving outside of the story campaign. And I, I don't know how to do that. I couldn't if I wanted to. But those games are magnificent and incredible for their own right too. So, you know, I guess I'm gonna say is if you go into a table, go in with as little expectation as you can, embrace and enjoy what's being provided there, and do your best to try and take it for that. Because, one, we don't need any more pressure on GMs out there to try and be something they're not. It's already a big undertaking. It's a, it's a heavy task to run a story for a party, but it's also one of the most rewarding out there, as long as the players are able to, you know, appreciate and express that appreciation for the time and energy that the GM has put into it. Um, anyway, tangent. Hi. <laughs> I did get a full night's sleep last night. First I think... The first in probably three to four weeks. <laughs> Between like Momocon and the, the, the Tomb of Annihilation reveal stream the weekend before that, and then it's just, it's been a month. <laughs> um, but it's been a good month, it's been a very good month. Uh, now we're rolling into Anime Expo, Comic Con, and Gen Con. So, Gen Con, Gen Con, I'm so excited. It's their 50th anniversary. 50 years! Gen Con's been around as a gaming convention. That's crazy. A gaming, fantasy, sci-fi, like it's just a, it's, it's a genre convention that is, it was my, you know, one of my bucket list things for years and years and years. I got to go for the first time last year and it was, it, you could hear like Dance of the Sugar Pump Flair, fairies playing as I danced around like, <laughs> Steve Jackson games! <laughs> Carcassonne! Like it, was, it, was, it was really exciting. If you have the opportunity ever to go to Gen Con, uh, you will game the whole weekend. It's going to be amazing. Uh, but this year, we're launching the, uh, releasing the, the first uh, Exandria campaign guide. The <laughs> Thank you. I hope you like it. I've never, I've never read anything like this before. It's, it, it, was, it, was, it was an undertaking. It wasn't something I wanted to do originally. It was when Green, Green Ronin contacted me uh, about a year and a half ago, like, hey, would you be interested in doing this? I was like, um, I mean, sure. <laughs> what do I, oh, oh no, I signed a contract. Now I gotta do this. <laughs> so I had to go through all my old notes and like extrapolate on things that have been forgotten or put to the wayside, things that the players never actually discovered, you know, side quests and story elements that that got bypassed and forgotten because that's how the indie works. But I got to go ahead and flesh those out and put them into a book and had to, you know, fill out the rest of the territory and uh, put my thoughts on a page and then think about it and write it in a way where somebody else could actually comprehend what the hell I'm talking about. So it's been a very, very unique process um, and I'm, I'm really excited and I hope, I hope people like it. I, uh, I mean, it's just hard to look at that and compare to all the, the, the main published settings out there. Like I grew up reading the Eberron, Forgotten Realms, Dragonlance, Greyhawk, like all these classic, classic, Dark Sun, like they're all so 
amazing and unique. And my world started without the intent of becoming a setting. I was literally just doing a vanilla fantasy made up world for my friends who had never played D&D before. So it's been a very unique challenge to try and find how it would stand unique against other settings, uh, but still staying true to how we built it naturally over the past four or five years and, uh, and throw a couple of fun surprises in there. Like I made me think about a calendar. <laughs> like, how many days are there in an Alexandrian year? Okay, and now uh, it's 11 months. Okay, what are they called and why? Okay, they have holidays. Oh, man. Okay. So, yeah, it's, it's been a very, very unique, uh, very unique process. So, I hope you enjoy it. Um, what else is coming up? We just, we had our other episode, we announced, uh, we, well, we, we announced we're putting everything in a podcast form now, which is great. <laughs> Took long enough. Oh, you're welcome. I mean, we've been wanting it for a long time, and it's always been one of those like, nah, it's too hard, we can't find it, it's a lot of content. And then some people higher up and Legendary changed over, and the new people, were, we were like, can we do a podcast? And they went, oh yeah, sure. <laughs> oh, okay. So, um, so really, really glad we're going to get that out to you guys. We have like a month or so, and we'll start doing the full rollout of hyper-releasing of episodes until we're caught up and uh, have it out there. So if those who have like, I like to dive into Critical Role, but... You know, the videos eat too much, uh, you know, data on my plan when I'm out driving. You can now download them as a podcast, so, yeah. Uh, and uh, we're going to have some other cool announcements in the coming weeks, which things that we're hoping to announce on the 100th, but things had to fall into place, right? So we got a couple, a couple fun things scattered throughout the next few weeks or so, so keep an ear out. Um, anyway, I've been talking at you for a lot. And I'm sure as many of you have some interesting or unique questions, because I like to have more of a conversation in a panel than just me going, Hi, words, listen! <laughs> um, so, that being the case, I don't know how, what would be the best way... How, how do you want to do this? How do you want to put the... <laughs> okay, so we're going to be doing the Q&A style. I want everyone who has a question for Matt Mercer to come in the middle in a straight line, and I'll hand you a microphone. And once you're done with your question, you give Calmly. it to the person behind you. Also, if you have gifts for Matt Mercer, I will be taking them from you. And I will put them over in this nice pretty corner, okay? Don't encourage it! <laughs> <laughs> if you have things to sacrifice on the altar of dark energy, lay them into the flames and bow. <laughs> That's all they're doing now. Exactly. <laughs> Into the trash fire that I lit at the start of the panel. Yes, please. <laughs> Breathe a few. <laughs> All righty. Uh, that would be actually some great room walla right there. That was some great piece of carrots, guys. Well done. Also, make sure to introduce yourself. Yes, please. I want to know your name. Okay. Hi. Sorry, I, I might cry. I thought you were encrypted for the longest time. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name's Eco. Hi, Eco. Um, okay, so I just I had my birthday recently. Happy and birthday! I, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, in critical role tradition, I wanted to have started DM campaign, but I also want to talk Makia. So, what is your favorite JRPG? Why? And how did it help you become, like, you don't have to answer all how did it help you be a better storyteller? Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, right? You're making me choose. You asked us to. Like, because, like, because <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, I got my Final Fantasy VI here, and I got my Chrono Trigger here, but I got, like, my Sweet Cut in 1 and 2 here, and then, ah, oh, you, why you do this to me? <laughs> I'll have okay no, no 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 I have I'll go with I'll go with probably Final Fantasy VI overall. <laughs> Partially because one when it came out it was like seriously pushing the limits of what we had seen capable of the SNES, especially once you got into your first like, airship moment in the game and you're like what? It's a 3D round world. Um, but like the story was so rich, the characters were so deep, and the story respected you enough to go into like some interesting dark adult themes. It dealt with elements of 
of you know loss of one's family, of of suicide. Like I went to a lot of really interesting dark places that these tiny little sixteen bit characters that are you know maybe a collection of forty pixels still make you like cry in your room, going like, no, Celeste, don't do it. You just need to find healthier fish to feed the sin so he gets better. That's a real part of the game. Uh, it was, just, it, was, it was an incredible story, uh, such a, a wonderfully uh, thought out world. Um, and then you had a Wendigo in your party, and, 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 and Go Go, whatever the hell he was. Um, but it was just such a, such a good game, and you had the loss of like Captain Leo. It, just, and, like, it was a dark RPG compared to previous ones, so I, I love that one. It affected me profoundly when it came out. Um, so I'd say. It, had it helped in the ways of helping me run a game. It tremendously helped me understand that uh, there is a lot of enjoyment in the difficulty of adversity and overcoming it. And it also allowed me to understand that sometimes it's okay to have a villain that is just pure evil. Yeah. Like, I love myself, you know, villains you can understand. I mean, Sephiroth, you're like, oh, you poor thing, you were lied to and, you know, abused by the military industrial complex of Shinra growing up, and, you know, you're not really at fault for how you turned out. Kefka, oh, you're just a dick. <laughs> you're just a terrible little clown man. And you hated him and you loved hating him. So yeah, like I learned a lot about, about that type of a villain archetype. I learned about various ways to tell a, elements of a dark story that can still be compelling, even though you're dragging your players through the muck. They'll still thank you and be like, that was really impactful and kind of helped me work out some things I wasn't thinking about. And you're like, oh, you're welcome. I'll, you can, I'll bill you for the therapy later. Good question. Thank you. Hello, I'm Daniel. Daniel. First thing I have to ask is, how are the dice I gave you last year? Was what? How are the dice I gave you last year at Acon? Oh, I have I have a giant collection. Uh, well, look, actually, this is kind of cool. Uh, we have a, me and Marisha have our giant dice collection that we're just like throwing into this 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 large uh, glass round fish bowl kind of thing, which is ironic now based on what happened a few episodes. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> We are gods. Uh, um, so, so whenever we're we're running a, a game for outside of Critical Role, like whenever I do like any of the celebrity D and D things, or I run a game for Wizards, I'll go ahead and grab a set of dice out of that, like a handful, and it randomizes each time. So I'm always playing with somebody else's dice that was granted from the community when I go and play one of those events. Uh, and they do swap out sometimes the dice I use in the show. I have like one or two dice that's, that are mainstays that are kind of like my, my uh, for lack of a better term, my, uh, my, my, my traditional... My beta, yeah. <laughs> the word I'm looking for is right, my superstition dice. Like I, I, I have my, my one big fate die, which is the, uh, the Shapeways kind of uh, mine looking one that I do for like big rolls. So like, I'll keep those around, but I'll swap out every now and then so I have this kind of constant flow of community given dice through my, my gameplay. And the second main one I wanted to ask is, in the next, when everyone re-rolls everything and becomes new characters, will you allow non-human half-elves, such as half-elf, half-dragons, or such as half-elf, half-werewolves, or such as half-elf, half-celestials? Uh, I mean, if the player is really driven in that direction, we can discuss and work something out. That's really up to the player, though. You know, so, on, on, some, on some degree, depending on the player, they might be like, "Ooh, I want to play a, I want to play a, a half gelatinous cube, half kobold." And you're like, "Okay, uh, uh, keeping that armor on is going to be really weird." <laughs> sure. Um, which yeah, Sam would, and he'd pull it off probably. Um, so I, yeah, I leave it up to the players. Um, I think some of them feel a bit of comfort in the existing racial elements, but they've expanded since we started this campaign with like Volo's Guide and some of the monstrous races, so I'm hoping to see some weird, interesting variations there. Um, uh, which by the way, half, half elf, half werewolf, technically is full elf with lycanthropy. <laughs> Depending on how you run your campaign. <laughs> Werewolves its own race, then totally go for it. And, and this is true. You're right. You're right. I stand corrected. Well, <laughs> you're, you're my new red shirt guy. That's awesome. Those are. Uh, hi, uh, my name's Chris. Hi, Chris. Uh, I too have disadvantage on social interactions and composure. Um, <laughs> 
Um, so my question is, is that uh, you obviously have a little bit of time to prepare for each episode every week. Um, I just wanted to know what kind of references from art, media, um, that you kind of fall on as you're preparing those games. Uh, ironic, based on the question earlier, I listen to a lot of video game soundtracks while I'm writing. Uh, mostly, like, honestly, my, my main state of playlist is a really great Chrono Trigger symphonic soundtrack that exists out there. It's like three discs, and it's, it's amazing. And so I'll have that on random play, and I'll throw in, like, some Dark Souls soundtrack stuff. I'll throw in, uh, some old, like, Sweet Couldn't One. Uh, so I, a lot of nostalgic music, because to me that brings me to a really creative place, and so I'll just have that thrown in there. Some Super Metroid actually goes in there really well, too. Uh, oh, Super Metroid. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but yeah, so like, that helps me out. Uh, as far as like other media, I don't specifically look to other forms of media to inspire me necessarily. If I have, I don't want to feel too influenced. And I've consumed so much media in the past that I think the nostalgia factor lets me just think back to some things that have profoundly affected me in the past or things that hung on. Uh, but I'm sure parts of it lead into it here and there. Um, like being reminded of American Gods because the new show's playing now in Stars. Um, which is, so it took a couple episodes to really get going and now it's so good. <laughs> um, so yeah, like those elements, as that, that show started, I'm like, oh, we're getting into an interesting arc now. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, who knows? Like, um, some, it's hard not to have the media around you influence you. Every, everything is derivative to a certain extent, and usually with respect and love. Uh, even a lot of the storylines I do, as much as I say, like, I, I created the story, but if you look, break it down, I'm sure there's basis and influences from like three or four different things that all led to this idea, because that's just kind of the nature of writing and media. Um, rarely is anything truly unique, and when they do, it blows my mind. Um, but music is a big thing for me. Music's just always been a creative trigger, and uh, that helps me out tremendously. Cool. Good question. Hello. Hi. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm Sydney. Hi, Sydney. And uh, of all the things I can spew out of my mouth, um, I just have one thing that I can, that I can think of. Are you a cowboy in a man costume? Am I a what? <laughs> <laughs> Are you a cowboy in a man costume? A cowboy in a man costume? Yes. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Nice try. <laughs> oh, boy. Hello, sir. You're wearing the proper t-shirt, I see. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'll try to follow up on that. Uh, my name is Pablo. Uh, the question I have was regarding the, I guess the title of the panel is, you know, part of, part of the title was the renaissance of tabletop gaming. Yes. I wanted to know what you think that if there was a specific point or, I guess, watershed moment that you could point to and be like, yes, this is when tabletop came, in, I guess, came back into, or came into the public consciousness and it's now more acceptable, if that's, do you think? No, no, it's a valid point. I mean, it, it kind of began with third edition because after the satanic panic of the 80s and such, D&D uh, &D and role-playing games in general really became a niche basement game. Like, you know, all the old Rift games and early World of Darkness and... Uh, you know, uh, mutants and, and, and superheroes, and like all different RPGs at the time, it was all very still enclosed, don't talk about it publicly. Most of the people in high school, dear God, don't let them know I play D&D. &D. You know, that type of an era. Um, third edition came out, and it, it was a little more accessible. It kind of brought the community back, the, the main community, but as far as like a, a major social, you know, rediscovery of the game, uh, I think a lot of it has to do... In a weird way, and, and I, one of the early triggers I think was Vin Diesel. When you have when you have a man who is on such an international level of stardom that like everybody knows him, and then suddenly word comes out that he plays D and D, and they start asking him this question at different celebrity events, and he starts talking about it in a non shameful way, and he's like, "Yeah, I play D and D. It's great. Yeah, I have my character's name tattooed on my side. Yeah, he's named Mel Corps. I love Tolkien. What? I'm Vin Diesel." <laughs> That's, that was a huge step, because all of a sudden people were like, well, if a diesel plays d &D, I mean, anybody can play d, &D then. And, and then they had, like, uh, uh, Stephen Colbert being so out and loud about his Tolkien obsession, and it's just become this, like, slow-rolling social acceptance of, oh, well, if these cool people play it, it can't be that bad. So that kind of began it a little bit. And then I think um, 
Acquisitions Inc. helped tremendously. A lot of the, uh, the the PAX games they would run because it brought in some celebrity talent, which brought some more. When I say celebrity talent, I mean like Patrick Rothfuss, a very very you know well established writer. Uh, you know, the, the, yeah, the, 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 the PVP guys. Um, you know, Will. All these different people that began to kind of just generate this this momentum for the community to rally more in, a, in like a, a media way. And then we have like the, the, the role play guys, you know, uh, with JP and, and M. Kobel and, and Steve Lumpkin, all the guys that ran these great online games. They began to build more and more of this community of people that could see people play and enjoy the game if they didn't have a frame of reference. And then when Twitch emerged, it was a platform that allowed us to do it live and allowed us to do it uncut, unedited, just raw and, and in the moment. And that was really the reason we started streaming our game. There wasn't a format. We didn't want it pre-filmed and released. And, Edited. We didn't want it to be this presentary for me. We wanted to just play our game, and if there are cameras there, then let it be. And I think that resonated because it felt like you were just picking in on somebody's game, and you were kind of invited to the table. And so, as those streams began to become more and more prominent, and allowed one people who used to play and then had families and kids and jobs and didn't have the time to do it anymore, an outlet to play vicariously through these streams and get excited again about a hobby that meant a lot to them when they were growing up, or remind them how much they enjoyed it so they can get back in contact with their old friends and start playing again, or a younger generation that never had an opportunity to really be exposed to this, that are now seeing it for the first time and going, oh, that looks like a lot of fun and very different than you know the video games I play online, let me try this, and as such, we have this amazing community that continues to spread. So I think a lot of it has to do with all those predecessors that kind of you know paved the way, and then now, thanks to streaming, it's allowed a lot more people to see it and connect it. So many people come to me and said, I didn't even know what D&D was or how it worked until I saw your show. And I'm like, oh, I can do that. And I'm like, that's why I started doing it. That's exactly why. Because I wanted people to look at it and go, oh, I can do that. I want to go do that with my friends. I want to go do that with my friends. So uh, for what, what small part we've played, we're super proud and, and excited that it's, it's become this kind of renaissance. And, uh, and and it's 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 a lar we're a small of a large part, and that involves you guys. Like, we're nothing without you guys. You, your community build everything. You've you've become more important about the show than we have, legitimately, because you all support each other so much. Because you guys are so great at helping each other out and signal boosting when someone in the community needs help or needs assurance and running games for people that can't find you know other players in their vicinity. And uh, when times are hard on a global scale or on a micro, you know, local scale, just making sure that we, everyone knows that we have a community of critters around. So you guys really are the, the, the reason that this shit is working and becoming so prominent. So thank you tremendously. <laughs> Been a while. I don't know why, but I'm feeling as excited slash nervous as when I met you a year ago. <laughs> I think it's for. <laughs> well, that's a good thing. Um, anyway, hi, I'm Jocelyn. You know, well, you remember me if yes. you want to. <laughs> um, I did mention a surprise. She managed to get it, and hopefully, you'll see it later. Um, oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, Does it detonate? <laughs> no, but. Okay, just making sure. But it's nice of you to well, mention your dice, because you might be adding to it, except uh -oh. in more ways than one with those. Uh, for you and Marisha, it's an engagement gift. Oh, thank you! Yeah. My boyfriend and I actually found, it, uh, well, found them at our lo local game store near my house, and like, once I saw them, like, bam, Matt and Marisha need these. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> anyway, um, good, good God, I have three questions running around in my head, but I'll stick to one. Okay. Um, what was your favorite comedic moment from when you played in the most recent one shot uh, that Liam was running? Oh man! <laughs> sure. doesn't know Liam O'Brien, one of our players, another uh, voice actor. He ran a one shot for all of us where we all woke up as ourselves but children. Very kind of Stranger Things style, uh, and it had some wonderful like comedic moments, some really like dark moments, some really heartfelt moments. It was wonderful. I think my favorite comedic moment is the fact that Travis Willingham just runs from everything. <laughs> like as a guy who, in his adult years, you know, six four, built like a truck, plays grog, a barbarian that just runs screaming into battle, ready to 
to shed blood, plays himself as a child, and at every encounter he's like, I turn around and run, <laughs> run as fast as I can, and then watching Laura be like, what are you doing? <laughs> it's attacking me, he's like, I don't care. <laughs> so, uh, probably have to go with that. Or, or as part of the, part of the encounter, uh, we ended up on the, the, the sound stage with, with, uh, uh, Neil, who's uh, he's the director of Last of Us and Uncharted 4, as kind of an inside joke. And in the battle, as the electricity, the, the electronics went crazy and ended up murdering people, they ended up killing Neil. And then as we're leaving the room, Sam goes up and drops his headshot and resume and goes, By the way, if you ever look into cast again, let me know. I'd love to work with you. That was a pretty great moment, too. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm Delphine. Hello. Hi. Um, first of all, really quick shout out to my friend who's dressed up as Victor. <laughs> yes, I saw you earlier! <laughs> hey, good coffee! <laughs> I love it. <laughs> we all will learn from your mistakes, Victor. <laughs> Um, my question is less about gaming and more of a personal thing. Um, I know you've been to like Australia, and I was wondering um, if you had a favorite place to travel or any fun like traveling stories. Oh man, I mean, I, I, I love to travel in general because you get the opportunity to meet people f from different cultures and, and learn about history from different places in the world. We're Americans. We're like one of the youngest countries in the world, and you're like, oh yeah, we have history. This building is 60 years old. Oh, man. Then you go over to Europe and it's like, this one is 600 years old. And you're like, and it's a 7-Eleven. <laughs> Which happened? I was, I was in Gutenberg, Sweden years ago, and there's this like, beautiful stone archway with a gargoyle, this like Gothic-style structure. I walk in and it's a 7-Eleven. I'm like, oh, <laughs> that feels so wrong. Uh, but, but for me, what I love about traveling is rediscovering that no matter where you travel, people are really the same. Like, people, once again, just want to be happy. They like to meet new people, learn things, and provide for each other, and get excited to share their culture with you, and vice versa, and ask you about yours. And no matter where you go, no matter what your religious background is, no matter what your, your, your family's history is, we're, we're all so fucking similar. <laughs> And it proves itself time and time and time again. So like, that, that's my favorite part of traveling, honestly. As far as a favorite place to go, uh, I, don't, I don't know, man. It's hard to pick. I, I, I really, really enjoyed Ireland. Ireland felt like, it felt like a fantasy world. It was, it was, everything was just green and lush and the skies were gray and rainy. It was Matt Wonderland. And everyone sounded whimsical and drank a lot of alcohol. <laughs> I kept trying to give it to me, and I was like, I'm, I don't drink that much. I'm really not, okay, okay, I'll just, oh God. <laughs> How, what happened in the last 12 hours? Um, so Ireland was a lot of fun, definitely. Good question. Hello. Hi, uh, I'm Nick. Hey, Nick. I, um, I just recently, in the past six months, started playing uh, Dungeons & Dragons as both a dungeon master. Ooh. Welcome. As, as both a dungeon master and a player, um, and uh, I've been working with my players to, in, in both uh, settings to try and create narrative and story uh, in both uh, environments. And I was wondering, how do you, as a dungeon master with Laura and the rest of them, like create uh, the narrative? Is it mostly like they write their backstory and you take and run with it, or do you, is there more conversation that happens later as well? It's a conversation. Um, what usually will happen is I'll give a little bit of the setting to the players beforehand. I'll write up an email that talks about the general, the landscape they're going to be starting in, some basic information about a few locations and some of the political structure that exists there, any possible like faction tensions that exist. And then the players from there will ask me a few questions about their character idea. I'll answer those questions. Then they'll write me a character backstory based on the information I gave them. Then from there, I'll talk to them and be like, okay, this is really cool. This part doesn't quite work with the way this thing works here. Is it possible we can change it a little bit to work this way? And they'd be like, okay, you know what? Yeah, that works out pretty well. And so we'll have, it's a conversation. Because you don't necessarily want the players to completely narrate the entire direction of your narrative because they want some surprises as well. But you also don't want to completely overtake it where they don't feel like their character stories are their own either. So it's, for me at least, I prefer to have a conversation about it, a little back and forth, and then you run with it. Can I follow up with that real quick? Real quick. Um, does that conversation continue later on, like, say, like, halfway through the arc? 
Yeah, it does. I'd, I'd say if the player if the player has anything they want to bring up or something about their past they've come up with an idea about they want to convey, they'll shoot me an email or a text and be like, hey, I was thinking about this. Can we incorporate something like this? And I'd be like, sure. Or like, uh, it might not fit for this. Or like, we've already met this character. It kind of contradicts this other element of the story. But it, but they're welcome to do that. I know Sam has done that a number of times. He's been like, so I have this idea about like, you know, Scanlan's thing here. Like the whole, like his whole year in Ankarel was a back and forth with him and, and lead up to read the recent story elements. So it's been kind of fun. Uh, or like time jumps. If like right before we started streaming, we had like a six month, seven month gap in a game story in which all the players then told me what they wanted to do over that and adjust any elements of their backstory or what has transitioned in that time that it would affect them going forward. So yeah, you can find points in the story, be open to it, just let players know that, you know, your word is law. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Hey, I'm Gabe. Hey, what's your name? Gabe. Gabe! Pleasure, buddy. Yeah, I actually uh, just moved down here from Pittsburgh about a year ago for, to Austin, Texas. I, I never got to play tabletops in high school, but I met awesome friends. We play like Dungeons & Dragons, Pathfinder, this anime tabletop called Big Eyes, Small Mouth. Yes, I've heard of that! <laughs> and uh, so my big thing is I'm finally like, okay, I'm going to be a DM this time. I want to jump into it. And so I make like ideas on the side, and I'm like, I'm going to incorporate that story into here. And I want to get more familiar with my players' characters and help them with theirs. So I'm trying to prepare ideas and like questions like, how did you wrong someone in the past? Or what is your perceived purpose in life? To both you know, give me a better idea of their character and help them get a better idea of theirs. So what kind of questions do you think you'd ask them? Good question. Those are great questions to ask there. Um, <laughs> are your parents dead? Yes or no? Circle one. <laughs> But don't leave the no, just leave the yes. Okay. Wonderful, thank you. We're gonna extend the panel 30 minutes so we can get through questions. Thank you, Akon. Um, yeah, uh, other great questions involve, uh, you know, what, what fear, what, what deep fear drives your character? Uh, what you know? What's a sec what's a major and secondary goal of your character at this point in their life? Not overall, because goals, as we all know, change pretty quickly based on what happens in your life. So, like in this moment when it starts, what's your major and secondary goal? Um, asking questions about: Do you have any uh, existing prejudices against uh, any factions in the world? Any any political figures? Anything that they can use to mess with them if they ever encounter you know this one lord that may have wronged their family long ago? You know, it's like is. Um, you don't have to get too deep. A really, really good game for reference that has a great questionnaire is the game Dread. Uh, part of the game structure is, uh, the game is built literally on just sending a questionnaire to the players and then the, you have to get the answers back and then you get to build the narrative off that. So that's a good, a good place to kind of look for a reference as well. So you say your character would be he who hunts elves? <laughs> His name is Squeegee. No wonder he hates elves. Elves probably hate him because his name is Squeegee. That's pretty awesome. Question. Uh, oh, and I would also say, uh, if you're having a hard time getting information out of your players, if you really want them to kind of provide you with some backstory, and it happens a lot, they'll lag behind. I had to drag information out of my players tooth and nail at the beginning because they hadn't played DD before. Like getting getting a backstory out of Sam was uh. the very beginning hard. Um, <laughs> incentivizing. Like, hey guys, we're all starting at level two. However, if you send me a backstory, you start with a bonus 500 experience points. <laughs> or you start with a bonus common magical item. The players will be surprised how quickly they'll get you a really well written backstory. <laughs> Little. And then if they all turn it in, then, oh, look, you guys all started with it. So you're all still at the same level. There's not really a benefit to it. But, uh, I mean, there is a benefit, but, like, there is no, ha-ha, I have one more item than the rest of you because I did my homework. <laughs> yeah, incentive, small incentives can be a really good way to try and help goad your players to really take the time to think. Because even if they don't write a backstory, some people who don't have a lot of role-playing experience might have a hard time finding it, how to get into character. And just sitting down and thinking about a backstory and thinking about a character's motivation, writing just a page of information about that character is an exercise in character building that when they do go to the game, 
they'll have a much stronger connection with this character and a much easier way of stepping into their shoes and thinking how they think. Um, so I, I recommend it if you have the opportunity, even if it's just a small bit of information. If that's the kind of game you want to run. Hello, Zah. Hello, Father. <laughs> <laughs> well played. <laughs> Seriously, though, my name is Chris. Good to have you again this year at Epicon. Um, my question is this. It's, I want you to name your top three hilarious moments, not we are gods, because that was most recent. <laughs> <laughs> Because we all know that one, but try to name your top three most hilarious moments so, from the top of your head, if you can, from Critical Role. Critical Role, oh man. Uh, the the camouflage moment was pretty great. <laughs> like, with the right combination of spells in D&D, it gets weird real fast. <laughs> um, so, like, having a bunch of people with this, with the, uh, uh, the, the, what the fuck is the spell called again? So thing seeming. I'm like, it's not sending, it's a different spell. But the seeming spell, turning them all into illusory cows, and then the flight spell to chase after a rock. So you have just like a bunch of flying cows of different sizes just coasting across the moonlight. Like some weird ET parody was pretty great. Um, uh, I mean, anytime Sam kills somebody with vicious mockery is pretty great. One of my, one of my, oh yeah, one of my favorite moments of the game still was early in the series when they were attacking the Emberhold and they're trying to do it stealthily, and all of a sudden, uh, Sam grabs Pike and the Dimension Door up at the top of the hold with a couple of these Duragar that are watching guard, and I think he does like a Thunder Wave spell or something that knocks him off the side, and one of them lands into the lava below and impacts and is like screaming and Keelan's right there and she goes, no, no, shh, 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 and just like uses her wind to push him faster into the lava as he's screaming. And he's like, ah, ah, she's like, no, no, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, shh, 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 ah. <laughs> it was such a horrible, wonderful, quintessential Keelan moment. Uh, it was beautiful. <laughs> And really, any time Grog decides to handle the negotiation of any purchase. A man who relishes in having terrible math skills and ends up walking back with less item, or more, with less items and less money, is a wonderful, wonderful experience. <laughs> Good question, thank you. You, sir. Uh, hi, sir, my name is Mac. Hey, Mac. Um, I was gonna congratulate you on your 100th episode, but as an insomniac, I think I'll just congratulate you on a full night of sleep. <laughs> Thank you, very appreciated. <laughs> um, you have expressed some frustration with your players because you are a human being and, and they are them. Um, so, with this being the last arc, I don't think that's too spoily. Uh, I was wondering if there are some things you're looking forward to, you know, being gotten rid of, whether it's like bartering over druid craft or some random item that has the word hand cone in it. <laughs> Anything that you'll be glad to see the last of, because it can't all be good. Have to list for when changing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, well, here's the thing. You can totally tweak anything you put in your game that you think is overbalanced. And I things that are super overbalanced, I'll tweak a little bit. There's certain items that have been around for a very long time. And they rhyme with oots of paste. Uh, that could probably use a tweak. However, they've been used so long for a certain way that it's my fault for not thinking ahead of that or understanding the rule system at the time well enough when I designed it. So I'm letting it stand. However, when the campaign's over, all those items are wiped away and everything is gonna be new and fresh and better balanced. Uh, so to quote, to quote Victor, learn from my mistakes. And that's, that's the thing about the show. Like, Critical Role, it's not a paragon of D&D. It's not an incredible sports level professional we are all just tumbling our way through the game at all times. We, we do some things pretty well, we do some things okay, and we do some things really poorly. And that's any D&D game. We're not trying to represent the, you know, the best version of it. We're just playing our game and hoping that you'll watch and, and embrace the things that happen really well and notice the things that don't go very well and be like, cool, avoid that in the future when I run my games, you know? And that's the best I can hope for. So that's a good example. Um, as far as The Last Art goes, uh, I'm looking forward to a number of story bits that are going to be coming forward, and I'm looking forward to the, to the party realizing that uh, agency is going to be an important part of this arc, and you can't take a long rest after every encounter. 
Or you might show up to places and everything's already happened. Hello, sir. Hi, I'm David. Hey, David. Uh, I'll keep this brief. Uh, specifically in terms of combat situations, how do you design each encounter or scenario so that it's fresh and that your players never sort of figure out your standard routine and keep them on their toes? Uh, that's something even I'm still learning as we go. Um, to me, the key to making a unique combat encounter is, one, providing creatures or antagonists in the scenario that have varying abilities than what they're used to. It's, okay, it's cool to occasionally throw in some creatures uh, that they know before, because they can use their player knowledge to that advantage. Not every fight in D&D is meant to be a drag down to the end of the line, you know, life or death situation. Um, otherwise, boss fights, you know, aren't that impactful. And conversely, players get tired. If every battle is super exhausting, you're just going to wear them out. And you want players to enjoy the fact that they've worked hard to gain this power and, and learn these abilities. And sometimes you want to throw them a battle that they're just going to steamroll and be like, Ha ha! I'm a goddamn hero! And you're like, yes you are! Good job! Because then you can use that hubris when they get to the next encounter. <laughs> So, <laughs> to, make, to make combat encounters interesting, if, you, if it's a certain creature you really like, but you feel like they're missing some unique tool, like you have a lot of party members, add an ability that does an AOE effect. You know, you can change anything that's in the books, you can alter anything that's in the books and make it your own. Sometimes I use creatures unchanged out of the book, sometimes I alter them dramatically or create new ones entirely. You have that within your power as a dungeon master because it's whatever you want it to be. So come up with creative ways that the enemies can attack or alter or shift the battlefield, pushing things away, restraining them where they stand, throwing them up against the wall and locking them there, um, making ravines or areas of the battlefield that are themselves challenges in the terrain that not are just pitfalls, but the enemy intelligently, if they're an intelligent enemy, can use to their favor. What happens if, if a creature grabs a party member and throws them off a cliff? You know, harpies are not that powerful, but I added a rule to harpies in my game, though they've bypassed them almost every time they've been there. <laughs> um, High-level magic makes it really interesting to try and do random encounters sometimes. Um, but like, I, I give the harpies ability where they, they have an attack type where they can grapple somebody and then move them at half speed if they don't break the grapple, which is really great at mountainsides. <laughs> All of a sudden, this like, low hit point harpy is a real issue. It's like, oh, my only attacks is like 17 damage, but if I drop you a thousand feet, <laughs> you're no longer a god. Uh, also, consider an encounter sometimes, if there's a narrative reason for it especially, come up with ways that there are non-combat specific challenges in the battlefield. Imagine a boss that has captured a number of villagers and locked them within a, a sphere of magic, and the longer they're in there, it's draining their life force. So the players not only have to defeat the creature, but they have to try and find a way to reduce, to take down this sphere, and the more combat rounds that go by, the more members of these villagers start withering and dying. So now it's like, do I attack the boss, or do I start trying to find ways to shut down this field? Maybe there's like hidden elements of this, this like magical construction that they have to go and they'll destroy the different parts, and they have to choose or split up. Do you distract the boss while we go do this, or do we not care about the, the villagers and just go after the boss, but now have to go back to town and deal with the fact that we didn't save a lot of people? You know, come up with unique ways to not just have moral quandaries, but to, to challenge what they consider a combat encounter is. Every now and then you want to have a hit point, just, you know, rush in and kill shit type fight, but you want to try and mix it up every now and then to make them think. Uh, I can go on a long discussion about this, and I, I, there's only so much I can even teach on that. Matt Koval has some great videos on YouTube you can check out. Uh, I know uh, Adam, Adam Koval, another Koval, Koval, interesting names, uh, has done a lot of great games with some interesting combat techniques. Um, High Rollers over in the UK, Mark does some great stuff too. Uh, so you can always look in some of their forums, some of their Reddit threads, and ask them on Twitter even for some, for some suggestions too, and they can probably help you out. Good. Hello! Hi, um, my name's Sky. Um, Hi, Sky. <laughs> uh, I'm starting a new uh, Pathfinder campaign of my own very soon. Nice. Uh, my first one, and I was wondering if you had any advice for a relatively new uh, GM who is pretty confident in the role playing and story aspect, but not so much in the balancing encounters and either, you know, accidentally everything's, you know, a super easy combat encounter that they can all just rush through, or the boss kills them all. You, you learn, I would say, start easy, then rank up. You know, 
it's much better to have a party steamroll an encounter, and then you can scale the difficulty from just experience and you know trial and error as you go than it is to have the first encounter just wipe everyone out. And you're like, well, that was fun. You guys want to come back next week? No? Okay, bye. <laughs> Yeah, so definitely err on starting the easier side and then learn from those encounters. Okay, that guy got killed way too fast, so he wasn't doing enough damage to be a threat. Next encounter, I'll up those kind of elements or add an ability that might shut down one of their spell casting shortly. Or what if an enemy, what if an enemy has part of the terrain that drops a portcullis and they all have crossbows? So the party has to find a way to get past that gate while they're being shot full of bolts that they can't find a way to avoid. You know, you just start, you learn from experience. Um, I can tell you right now, the first three years I ran D&D &D out of high school, those games were awful. It was so bad. Because I didn't have any basis of reference. I just had the books and whatever I thought might work. And so we didn't know any better. And by then we were like, this seems fine. You know, flaming room, this is fine. The cup. That, that was my early D&D, &D, but we didn't know any better. Um, so don't be too worried about having to get it right out of the gate. You'll learn, you'll, you'll come up with some great in, ingenious moments. Some things won't quite live up the expectations you hoped, but you learn from those and adjust as you go forward. And also, my other big advice for a new time DM, you don't have to over-prepare one single thing. If you spend so much time putting out all the details of one small aspect of the story, what happens if the players five minutes in go, we're gonna go this way. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so what, which will happen because that's part, of the, that's part of the joy of D&D, &D, part of the rush of being a game master is when that happens. What I would recommend, instead of fleshing out a lot of detail of a small area, flesh out a fair amount of detail about a number of them. Because if they do go left, maybe there's a little tiny thing you like put some afterthought to and a little bit of development here that you can then tailor to cover that left turn. And you'll feel a lot more comfortable having a loose outline that then you can improvise from on the fly, especially if you're really good at narrative and storytelling. That's great, because then the, the rule set will handle itself, and the players will also work with you on that, and you'll learn as you go. But if you over-prepare one single thing, you'll end up getting real nervous when they don't go where you think they will, because they won't, because players do that. <laughs> Good luck, that's awesome. Hello. Hello, I'm Gloria. Hello. Um, I just recently graduated with a history major and an English minor, which if they not <laughs> anything it's that words are important and absolutely everything has a story so your two signature catchphrases how do you want to do this and you can certainly try where did those come from uh, those came from just playing the game uh, you can certainly try came out of me not ever wanting to shut down a player the players like uh, they're like all of a sudden you come from the edge of the hallway and you look and, and the cliff just drops off and there's just an empty expanse the players like well uh, can I climb down the rock and sometimes, especially if you're new to gym, you'd be like, no, you can't, you'll fall and die. <laughs> Which immediately to me shuts off that creative aspect of the player wanting to think of creative ways to solve a problem. You, instead, I prefer to go, well, you can certainly try. <laughs> which, which makes them go, hmm. <laughs> I don't, why are you saying it like that? <laughs> And then they, but then they still might want to explore it and be like, okay, well now I'll look over, because now you've given them just a hint of an idea that it might be possible, which then will lead them to explore more and be like, okay, well I look over the side, how jagged is the rock on the, you know, the, the crevasse below and be like, actually it's fairly smooth in places, but roll a perception check. Okay, you notice that there are a few outcroppings that could probably be climbed if you want to try and attempt it. It's like, okay guys, who has some rope? Suddenly it went from a no to, all right guys, that's not gonna work, to now we have a possible plan. How can we as a team come together with our skills and equipment and make this work? And so for me, you can certainly try as an invitation to a possibility without shutting down the player's creativity. And I think part of the real joy of D&D, especially as a game master, is providing situations where the players can surprise you with their ingenuity and themselves appreciate some of the things that they brought along or chose as their character class they don't get to use very often and find a way to circumvent a challenge using them. So to me, you can certainly try is, is that fine line between saying, I mean, you could. Uh, and then how do you want to do this? For, for years it was just like, all right, you got the final kill. Describe the final kill. You know, and then eventually it got to like, all right, you got him, describe it to me. And eventually it was like, all right, how do you want to kill them? How do you want to do this? It was just a natural evolution of the years of me running games at home. And then how do you want to do this for some reason? It just had like a nice ring to it and the players began to celebrate that phrase. It became its own little catchphrase at our home games. And you say, how do you want to kill them? It's just like, it's, it's less of a, a banner or a t-shirt. <laughs> 
So it kind of it evolved into that. And then once we got to how do you want to do this, it had that like, yes, okay, all right, here's what I do. I cut his throat and grab his hair and tell him as he slowly bleeds out and his eyes go numb, say hi to your mother for me. <laughs> <laughs> so like, you know, it's, it became that much more of an, imi an underlying imitation for that cinematic moment. So it just stuck and then uh, unintentionally passed it on to all you guys. So you know, I'm, I'm proud papa. <laughs> Thank you. Hello again. Hello again. Um, Which, by the way, every time I see your camera, it makes me think of like the Predator arm cannon. I know. I love it. It's kind of awesome. Um, my name's Sarah. Uh, at the autograph signing, I thanked you. I kind of want to go into a little bit more detail. I okay. came from one of the Satanic Panic families. <laughs> So my first experience with D&D &D was extremely lame with a role monger, and it's, you have no idea, I can't speak for everybody in the community, but you have no idea how nice it is to see a DM who isn't killing the players with the rules, and to know that my style of DM isn't actually weird. So thank you very much for that. You're, you're welcome. My, um, my actual question is, can I get a soundbite of Victor for my phone? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, what soundbite do you want? Um, I don't want to encourage this, this will end up being the rest of the panel, guys. <laughs> You're well within your rights to say no, but... Um, is that the quote you want? <laughs> sure, that's perfect. <laughs> yes. You are well within your rights to say no! <laughs> I had to get the spittle in there. It was part of the process. Sorry, table. And let it be known, too, uh, running a really hardcore D&D &D game where it is kind of trying to destroy the players, Dark Souls level, like, super hard mode, is totally a fun and viable way of running the game, too. Just make sure you communicate that with the players, and everyone understands that's what you're in for. Because if they don't, and they want a different type of style of game, that's where it becomes a very unfun, frustrating circumstance. But if you're all down for that type of gameplay, it can actually be really cool. <laughs> Awesome. Sir, what's Hi. your name? This is wonderful. Whoa. This is wonderfully weird after seeing you on the screen for a while. Hi, I'm Isaac. <laughs> Would it be better uh, if I did this? Basically, <laughs> <laughs> I just sit like this the entire time. Not anymore, based on the new set, baby. I can stand again. <laughs> the power! It's, it's overwhelming. <laughs> Power just, overwhelming. Sorry. I just came from a game, actually, and I had many a complicated, deep question to ask you, but because this just happened to me, I have to ask this. I talisoned my first game with my other DM just now, and I want to know how tired of you are of Talus and Percy? <laughs> of rolls? I, I can't say I'm tired because it makes for really cool moments. If it was, if it was a really like lame character that was like. Well, yeah, you know, I'm a fighter, and like I, I wander the world for power because my parents are dead, and I want magic weapons. And then he rolls twenties all the time. I'd be a little like, come on, man, you can't game shark this shit. <laughs> like, yeah, but, but Percival's such a, a such a cool character, and I mean, it is, it is, uh, it is witchcraft <laughs> that he rolls as well as he does. He's beating math. <laughs> he is. He's the anti Wheaton. <laughs> but nothing will blow my mind more than Will Wheaton stand on the show. That was. Like, mathematicians left the field after that night. They were like, nope, nope, we're done. Probability has no purpose. <laughs> we, are, we are rocketing towards the entropic heat death of the universe. Thank you, Will Wheaton. Uh, <laughs> so, like, I, I, it doesn't frustrate me. Uh, it just means I have to work harder to kill him. <laughs> exactly. Or, like, what else can I do to give him disadvantage all the time? <laughs> Puns, puns will work. I can't combat his puns. Tell us, tell us, I said this to, to a few friends last night. Like, you know the whole Dos Equis, most, most interesting man in the world commercials? That should be Taliesin. He's like the most fascinating human being I've ever known. I've known him for a long time. And he is just an eclectic, interesting man of all realms of life experience and strange occult world knowledge. Uh, he, he, is, he is the closest thing I have to a modern-day shaman. It's, it's amazing. Um, so yeah, I think he's earned those 20, 28. So. <laughs> the man's probably done enough rituals in his teen years to make it so. <laughs> awesome. All right, yeah, so we, we, got, we got 30 more minutes, guys. We can do this. We can do this. Uh, hi. Hello. Uh, my name is Michael. Uh, you're honestly one of my idols. I never thought I'd get to talk to you like this. Uh, I was poor two days ago. Didn't think I'd be able to make it tonight. Woo! 
like it. Yeah. So uh, two questions. One's a little bit more on the serious side. The other's just kind of, I want to know your opinion on it. Sure. First, uh, with all the satanic panic and all the witch hunts for D&D &D back in the day, what really was the driving force for that? Because I, I, I hear a lot of differing things, conflicting things, you know, darkest dungeons, things like that. The driving force for a lot of things like that are the same reason that people were blaming video games for violence. And, you know, there are some individuals that might be, you know, causes, but I think whenever youth, uh, whether it be through, through untreated mental illness or uh, parents ignoring a difficulty that someone's going through in the teenage years, which is a very difficult time for anybody, as many of us know, or currently know in the moment, it's not an easy time. A lot of chemical changes, a lot of physical changes, a lot of very, very difficult social structures in school and outside. Like, it's a very hard time, and sometimes people do terrible things. And if a parent isn't paying attention, if a parent isn't, isn't involved, if a parent doesn't want to take any responsibility for that, Sometimes they want to look for what else there is to blame. And so I think a lot of that stems from people that wanted to find other excuses for uh, unfortunate behavior than wanting to take responsibility for the fact that maybe I wasn't there for my child. Maybe I didn't inquire or care why they were lashing out. Maybe I you know, got too busy with work and didn't want to deal with the stress of wondering why they were so quiet and not contacting and communicating. And then you know, maybe I need to really reevaluate if I was being a good parent or not. Instead, they were playing D&D, &D. it's D&D's &D's fault, you know? The wacky tobaccos, the Dungeons and Nergans. Now, my second question, if you had to pick any other system, not D&D &D or Pathfinder based, to bring, run the players through, run the current group through, what would you pick out of all the systems out there? What, what was your favorite, preferred kind of system? To introduce somebody? Uh, a little bit, little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. To introduce somebody, something you just enjoy doing? Both. Uh, I mean, I, I really like 5th edition. I think of all the D&D editions, it's the most, it's the easiest to understand. Comparably. Comparably. Like, if we're looking like 2nd edition, <laughs> Thacko, no thank you. Trying to introduce that to kids nowadays is going to be a rough one. Um, it has, 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 has a place in my heart, but esoteric math is a difficult thing to introduce to new people. Um, for those who don't know Thacko, oh, look it up. Um, but uh, I think the 5th edition is a good way of weaving narrative and role-playing context into combat rules without them being two separate parts of the system. You know, advantage and disadvantage works both skill checks and combat. Uh, abilities that can affect one sometimes affect the other. Like it's, just a, and, and it's simplified and streamlined to the point where it's not quite as intimidating for people who have no role-playing game experience. If they're really new, I think uh, like Dungeon World is also a really even simpler system that's really, really good. That helps bring people into it and give them the idea of role-playing without having even as complicated a rule set as D&D 5th Edition has. Um, uh, I think the Fate system, Fate Core, is actually really, really good too. Um, it has good like scaling system for success and failure. Uh, those are all really good places to look, in my opinion. And I like them all. I enjoy them all. Yeah. Go back up. Hello. Hey. So I was wondering, um, as a DM, do you ever just get really, really mad at your players, maybe? And how do you deal with that? Like. Do you maybe make a really, really hard encounter? How do you reward them if they actually come, a, you know, come above that? Are you mean angry about what, like, how good they're doing the game, or angry at them, like, personally for what mm, they're doing? Maybe a little bit of both. Okay. Um, <laughs> sometimes, I mean, human beings will have conflict, and uh, even when you're friends, there will be moments of tension in a game environment or outside of it. It's unavoidable. You know, there there is always going to be dissonance occasionally between human beings, no matter how much you care about each other. Um, I've had many games in the past, you know, before Critical Role, where certain players were either just having a bad day and lashing out at the group, or a new player to a game just didn't jive with the rest of the way we wanted to play the game, and instead was kind of taking over and ruining the experience for other people for their own power trip. And in a lot of the circumstances, you just have to take the player aside and talk to them and let them know. You know, the moment it starts getting weird, be like, alright guys, let's take a quick break, uh, bathroom, get snacks. Hey, uh, let's talk for a second, you know, and just take them aside and be like, hey, I'm feeling like this weird tension, or like, the way you're playing, uh, like, is everything okay? You know, it's, you know they, don't be afraid to engage and ask what might be the reason for that going on, and sometimes they might be like, actually, yeah, you know, my girlfriend just broke up with me, or like, I just found out that a friend of mine is sick. Or they can be like, no, man, I don't want to talk about feelings, whatever. Then, then maybe they don't belong at your game table. <laughs> But like having a conversation and just, just opening up to that much might help them feel better and work through whatever they're going through at the table or help you realize that they need to find a game group that's more their speed.
You know, not just because everyone shows up at the table doesn't mean you're all forced to play together. You want instead to, it's better to divide if you're not jiving and both find game groups that work for you than to try and make it work in spite of it, you know. So that conversation helps a lot. Um, I've had players that got really, really drunk at games and ended up disrupting it after rep repeatedly asking them not to do that and then eventually had to tell them, like, sorry can't play anymore, you're not respecting the time and energy we're all putting into this to schedule it and the time I'm putting in to prepare for it. And they were like, okay, no, I get it, you know. Usually, when it gets really bad, they'll, they'll understand that. So, uh, it's, it's not an easy thing, and it does happen occasionally, but just being forthright, being open, asking about it, and seeing what you can do to come to a compromise. And if there isn't a way to do so, you think, then just go your separate ways. That's my recommendation. Thank you. Hi, I'm Colin. What's your name, sorry? Uh, Colin. Colin. And by the way, I didn't get your name. What's your name? Oh, Mason. Mason. There you go. Thank you, Mason. <laughs> Hi, Colin. So, uh, whether it's from someone who influenced you in your life or your own thoughts, what was your biggest aha or epiphany moment in regards to how you think about DMing or how you uh, act as a DM? Um, that's a good question. Huh. I think... Oh man, that's a really interesting question. I hadn't really thought about that specifically. I would say a lot of it is learning from other friends I played with. Um, things that I really like about their games. I, my, my friends like Jason Bender and Sean Manzano, uh, who I used to play games back in the mid-2000s, they were, you know, Jason was like a game designer and Sean worked in QA and they were both not the kind of people who necessarily had a, bless you, a theatrical flair you would expect. But when they got to the table, they were so invested in their story that they still managed to, to show glimmers of like this great narrative flair to the way they would tell the story. And I really enjoyed that. And it kind of reflected what I wanted out of my games. And as I was getting heavily into community theater and improv, I loved the idea of, you know, storytelling and then asking others to return it. And so at the same time that I was enjoying these games with my friends that they were running uh, and games that I was running for them, I was also honing my skills specifically in that field of, of, of inviting others to add to a narrative and to describe verbally, verbally scenes to get an audience's attention. And so I kind of, those skills came together at the same time when I found it was hard to get people to engage in D&D, especially actors, performers. That was the thing too, is as the years went on, a lot of my friends ended up becoming actors that I was trying to get into D&D. A lot of conversations, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, where like someone will bring up at a party or like a get together, be like, I never, well you play Dungeons and Dragons, how does that work? I'm always like, oh, that's an invitation to suck you in, my friend. So I began to just drag friends into it and like ask people like, well, if you're not busy next Friday, come over. I'll run a one shot for you guys. You know, first one's free. <laughs> um, and so, so that that I think had a lot, a lot of influence on me just learning it over time. Um, as far as specific people, I mean, book writers like Neil Gaiman, who's just incredible, incredible like intricate character narrative and like setting a scene and, and unique spins on existing like lore and mythology um, as far as combat sequences sometimes a lot of anime I don't even say like uh, the exalted RPG is basically anime the RPG and that was kind of fun for a while too um, I don't I don't know of any specific people because when I, when I was learning to DM there wasn't like other figures that DM'd publicly it wasn't like you know there was a Chris Perkins at the time that I could look at and be like Master, teach me. <laughs> so, you know, we were all kind of learning in a vacuum. So I just, it was a combination of skills that I was learning at the time and like learning what I liked from other people I played with. And over time, just kind of fine tuning what I really got enjoyment out of and was able to extract from the players. I think I hope that answered somewhat. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Taylor, and uh, so my friends and I, who I play with, we're a big fan of you, and we get our groups together, sort of like, because, like, partially an idolization of you, but we go from coast to coast all at college, we get on Skype, and we play for, like, six hours a day, somehow managing to get all across the time zones. That's awesome. But we do a lot of sci-fi uh, RPGs, so I wanted to ask, what's your favorite, like, sci-fi system? Oh, man. Uh, I really enjoy Traveler. I'm doing that right now. Good, good. It's a great system. One of the few systems where you can die in character creation. Because <laughs> it's cool. As you create your character, you, you, you basically you, you work out their arc of how they grew up and how they developed. So you can be like, well, I can play that plucky young 20-something who's new and trying to make his name in the world. And that's cool. So you can start as a mercenary. You're a 20-something mercenary. 
So you get the skills of a 20 year old mercenary. You're like, but if I want to be a more hardened criminal in his like late 40s, then you can go from that mercenary. But then once that work led him into a darker field, then began to, to break the law and do more criminal smuggling. So now you go for the smuggler set, which adds more skill bonuses to you. But you're a little older, and sometimes you get some penalties for age, some benefits to your wisdom for age. You're like, cool, 45. But if I take him to like a 55 year old drug lord who's run from a smuggling ring, and it's just through that, okay, I'll be roll randomly. Oh, he got killed in a firefight. <laughs> Let's start the one again. That's a possibility in the system. So it kind of like, do you want to risk pushing the envelope a little bit for that dangerous lifestyle for those extra little skill bonuses? And I love that aspect of it. But that's a really, really cool system. It very much plays into that kind of pseudo Star Wars, more like firefly esh type universe. Um, little space balls-ish, if you want to. <laughs> um, but yeah, Traveler's fun. Diaspora's fun. Diaspora's a good system. I ran a game, never run a game, I played in a game for a while that was run by a guy named uh, Philip. He was the writer of the movie Event Horizon. And so he ran a pretty good sci-fi horror game. <laughs> that guy has some issues in the best way. Uh, if you haven't seen Event Horizon, well, don't eat before you do. Um, yeah, so th th those are great sci-fi games. Uh, I haven't had a lot of experience with a lot of the more recent ones, because I've been kind of stuck in D&D world for a long time, since that's where my heart is. Um, but those two I enjoy a lot tremendously. And actually, the, I hear a lot of good things about the new Star Wars RPG. Uh, the most recent one. Although the, 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 there, was a, there was a Fate version for a while that I heard was really good. Um, right, that was good too. Um, I haven't played it yet, had the opportunity. I know uh, uh, a couple of friends have been threatening to one day run that for me, and I'm like, sure, the company is free time. Let me finish the campaign guide first. So, thank you. Good question. <clears throat> Sorry. Hello. Hi. Um, I, I'm Trustin. Hi, Justin. Trustin. Trustin. Yes. <laughs> I trust me. I'm sorry that came out so. I knew it as it was happening. It was awful. I owe you a sincere apology. It's okay. It's just every day of my life. <laughs> okay, so um, I actually started D&D only like a couple months ago. Uh, Welcome. With my with my brother, he's DMing. He's back there somewhere. <laughs> oh yes. Um, <laughs> so, um, I have two questions. Yes. First one is just, um, I'm trying to make this character that's like a super like destruction happy, happy, fun, fun, kill, kill, and kill type of character. Like very much based off of like Jinx or Harley Quinn. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was wondering, like, just takes joy in like just causing as much panic and fear and stuff. <laughs> um, I was wondering what sort of class you might recommend for that. Oh man. Well, talk to your group. Make sure that they know the kind of character you're making so you don't end up bringing that to the table with like a lawful good paladin. Don't worry. Because that might be a very short campaign for you or them. I don't know, I feel like it'd be fun. <laughs> so, you know, well, it could be interesting. Just be aware, it might be a very short, fun campaign. Uh, but if you're all playing kind of sort of a suicide squad type, you know, kind of whatever it takes to get the job done, group, then it can be a lot of fun rampant uh, destruction. And in that case, I mean... Barbarian, man. <laughs> just, you're just an engine of upfront destruction. Yes! <laughs> like, it, it's, it's a class designed to just be like, oh, that? I want to kill it. I want to kill it in the face with my face. <laughs> so Barbarian's great, but then you get the multi-class and there's some other fun elements. Like, Barbarian with some fighter classes with Action Surge, as you've seen with Grog, is disgusting. Um, barbarian... Uh, or if, if, if you want to, if you like to tear things together as a beast, you can take Druid and a couple levels of Barbarian so you can like rage and then be shaped. So you're like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. You think this creature is scary? This giant, you know, saber toothed cat? How about if it takes half damage? <laughs> um, but if you want to, like, I mean, then you also have Wizard if you want to just tear things apart. Warlock's fun to me. Yep. Oh, Warlock's a great option if you want to be more like crazy orchestrator of death to everything around you. You know, and you're dead! <laughs> and your house is on fire! And I summon a demon beast to devour your family! <laughs> also fun. 
Um, so for the one you're describing, I think good fits would be Barbarian or Warlock as a base, most definitely. Okay. Uh, just the second question is, on my brother's absolute insistence. No, you don't need to. Come on. No, I'm going to do it anyway because he forced me to. <laughs> <laughs> He just wanted you to say "fuck you, Reed" in Yusuke's voice. Like, say "fuck you, what?" Fuck you, Reed in Yusuke's voice. Uh, fuck okay, you, no. Ryuji. <laughs> Doesn't seem to like in the art that I make. What a bastard! <laughs> Malich. <laughs> it's not in your presence. You may rise. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Jerry. Yeah, pleasure to meet you, man. Uh, so I'm a panelist, and I'm a newly DM of uh, seven months. Awesome. Uh, I've ran about a couple uh, campaigns. My first one being an evil campaign, actually. <laughs> it got pretty weird. They um, usually do. It's okay. <laughs> I mean, sex dungeon weird. <laughs> There's a point to it, too. There's a point to okay, it. Okay, okay. Like, they didn't interact with it, but it's more like uh, one of the players who's a tiefling chaotic evil character was not making perception checks at all. So, I I used it to where when he turned around, all of it disappeared, and then a huge hole appeared of, like, a big, massive monster. So, yeah. Um, also, yeah. Go on. Again, we... <laughs> so much I want to say to you about my campaigns. Also, I played a lot of characters. I played a character named Kyo, who was a druid half-elf... Half-elf mini Nissa trap. So... Hmm. Looked a lot like Nissa, and uh, I, I currently play a a halfling rogue with thief with a criminal background who I dumped almost all my points in dexterity and stealth and slide of hands at plus five. So he cannot not be stealthy. But my question, my question, yes. okay. Um, so since I watched a lot of your game tip, like your DM tips, mm -hmm. uh, which is why I got a Dungeon Master Guide hardcover awesome. for 50 bucks. Um, I want to know how was your how was your um, campaigns how were how were they like when you first started and what brought and what brought you to forming it into Critical Role? Uh, my very first campaigns when I was in high school were me, my cousin Steve, who was a uh, a an elven thief mage um, named Antibe Curios, which then eventually became a NPC in future games. Uh, my friend Ian, who was my buff Korean friend who just wanted to pick a fighter that could grandmaster dual long swords and kill stuff. He was the, the epitome of min-maxer, but like in a loving way. And then my friend Todd, who found an archer kit that completely broke second edition where he could shoot like seven arrows around. I, remember, I, I just remember there was, there was an encounter where they entered, accidentally entered the lair of like uh, of, uh, an ancient uh, blue dragon. And it was asleep, and all of a sudden they roused it and it began to wake up. And I described described as his eye open, and he goes, oh, I attack it! And he killed it one round, and I'm like, Ooh. And I went, all right, your character's broken, buddy. Um, so yeah, that was pretty, it was, they were pretty, pretty rough and silly and like randomly rolling with it. We were learning by just trying things out and failing miserably, so. Um, and what got me a critical role? Felicia Day asking if he wanted to stream it, and us going, She's like, but Twitch. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so that's basically it. <laughs> Don't ever trick your. Why? Why would you do that? <laughs> I'm going fucking with my party. Understood. Does your party like it? <laughs> okay. As long as they're okay with it, it's fine. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hello. Hi, my name is Alexis. Hi, Alexis. You look amazing, by the way. It's a awesome outfit. Thank you. Um, I also want to say it's nice to see you again. I got to meet you two years ago at ColossalCon. Oh, awesome! Oh, ColossalCon. By the way, guys, if you've been to ColossalCon, 
It's got a pool inside and a swim up bar. Come on. <laughs> it's fun. It's good to see you again. Um, I actually had um, a friend want me to ask you a question, so I'm doing that for him. Um, he wanted to know, what class did you first start out, and did you start favoring a specific race when making characters? Uh, my first character ever was a human wizard named Trent, Emeritus Trent, which is actually, I took the name from the Xanth book series by Piers Anthony. Um, and I was like, oh, I want to be a wizard that uses a sword and get up in the fray, because I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Um, so I used a militant wizard kit in second edition, which basically was like the worst wizard kit ever. It basically was like, you get no benefits except can use a sword, so now you're a wizard that gets up in front and killed. <laughs> which happened. So yeah, no, that was my first character. It was really bad. As far as uh, races, I tend to favor when creating characters. Uh, there's, a, there's a gross, under, there's, there's a glut of elves. Don't get me wrong, I like myself some elves, but everyone's like, I want to be an elf. I'm like, I want to be a dwarf. Yeah! I love dwarves. Dwarves and halflings get underrepresented, I believe. And so like, those are my two favorite races and probably the two that I'd lean if I got to create another character. Definitely. Yeah! Represent halfling! That happened. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good to see you again. What's up? The Lola's is great. Any monstrous races? Yeah, go for it. Heck yeah. Aarakocca, man. Nothing, no DM loves anything more than a player that can fly at low level. It's great. All right, guys, we're, unfortunately, we're running really low on time here. The time they give us, I'm going to try and get through some rapid-fire questions. So, quick questions, quick answers, and if I don't get to your questions, I sincerely apologize in advance. See if you can bring them. I have another panel tomorrow. I know it's not D&D related, but I won't argue if a couple D&D questions slip in there. <laughs> <laughs> Sir. Uh, hi, I'm Jack. Uh, hi, Jack. First off, thank you for blessing my dice earlier. Uh, as, a, as a new DM, I will try to use my powers for good. No promises. That's like any good DM show. <laughs> Uh, first off, as, as I leave, I'd like to show you just a very quick picture related to the goldfish. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think you'll enjoy it. That'll be as I leave. Uh, my question is, uh, what do you think was like, what was the first moment, first like events after you started, started Twitch? What was that moment where you just kind of sat back and realized, oh, this is actually a thing that is big and has followers? Uh, I think when we began to get mass donations to charity, to 826LA, when we began to get like $100 donations, $200 donations, I was like, people are legitimately excited about supporting these charitable causes in the name of playing role-playing games. It was amazing. And then when we just, people were asking us, like, make merch, make merch, like, you know, I don't know what that is. Uh, we'll just make a hundred t-shirts and see if you want to buy them. Hey guys, so we put a couple t-shirts up there. If you want to, they're sold out. What? <laughs> That was when it really hit home, and we were like, what is going on? <laughs> yeah, thank you, good question. You look amazing! Oh, thank you. Oh, I'm... they brought it, oh, that's an amazing picture. <laughs> I can finish the line? Okay, so we move fast, we're gonna finish right. the line, guys. All right, my... cool. Hey, I'm, I'm writing my own campaign setting, and I wanted to know, based on your experience running and writing the guide, what's the most unusual or unexpected thing that you've had to create that really makes the world seem living? Oh, that's an interesting question. <laughs> um, fleshing, honestly, fleshing out factions, and not just like racial, you know, city-based factions, but fleshing out secret small factions, coming, trying to think of what things the players might never encounter, uh, thinking about what, what individuals might work behind the scenes of certain areas. And considering that maybe, this, this is actually pretty fun, considering that not every major town in a fantasy setting is just the races in the book. Because sometimes not all gnolls might be evil, not all, you know, orcs are marauding killers, you know, not, you can consider that a lot of creatures based on their life experience and things can, can still engage in, and move into different elements of society. So, whereas in this campaign, I'm running with, with, with our players, you know, it's largely the classic races that they've encountered. They've also not been to a lot of cities across Taldore in which it is a little more of a robust kind of come one, come all type environment. So that was a unique thing to develop. Definitely. You look awesome! <laughs> all right. Let's get a mic to a place where I can actually talk. Hi. Hi. I'm Jackson. Jackson. Uh, I'm one of the DMs from Dungeon Crawl Gaming. And, uh, awesome. And I've made a Legend of Zelda themed campaign, and to do that I had to rewrite the entire racist section of the player handbook because there aren't orcs in Hyrule. 
But one of the things that I found very challenging was to incorporate how a Goron rolls. And so what I was thinking, uh, have there ever been like things from video game or from media that work really well in that, and you've tried to translate to D and D, and it didn't quite work? What did you do in those scenarios? Um, I mean, the, there are elements of the the what eventually became the Blood Hunter that kind of stemmed from inspiration of classic Witch Hunter classes and the Witcher game. That were like, cool, if I can make something like that in here. And then I, as I began to try and prune it out, it was kind of hard to tailor in the rules, and I decided to go ahead and make it something wholly new in my own. So that particularly was kind of hard. Back in the day, I remember very early in my D&D career helping my friend make Ryu as a D&D character. Because he just really wanted to play Ryu in D&D. We were so dumb. <laughs> and it was so broken and stupid. And after a game, we went, no, that was no. No Ryu in D&D. Sorry, man. So yeah, that happens. <laughs> Thank you.